Welcome to another uncomfortably intimate South Beach session with my lovable, repressed male friend, Amin Al Hassan. I tell him uh, an unusual number of times that I love him. I see his discomfort all the time, every time I do. We talked a couple of years ago when you made the bold decision to just jump from ESPN into my loving, hairy bosom in a way that I did not understand how much trust you had in me or in us to figure out what you would do in the future and what your kids would be doing in the future. But you left that decision to us, and we seem to have figured it out. You are here now for a couple of years, and what I wanted to talk to you about, among other things, I've noticed the way that America has changed recently that I find myself more and more appalled about how flippant people are about freedom. You've heard me say before that people who have to flee to find freedom or fight to find freedom seem to have a greater appreciation than people like even me who were born in this country and don't know what my parents went through to get me that freedom. You are Sudanese, and one of the things that I have noticed about you, I mean, in conversations that we've had, it feels like you're a little bit lonely in this country being Sudanese because your people are suffering and you are not suffering the same way they are. It's a recurring theme with you. What's happening there with you when you when I describe you as lonely in that regard? Is that accurate? I wouldn't call it lonely, but sad and uh, maybe tormented sounds a little too dramatic, but it's something that I struggle with a lot. Um, is uh, I guess it's a form of survivor's guilt, the idea that uh, I am not subject to the things that they're subject to. And right now, uh, in the, Sudan is in the news, or should be in the news at least, because of what is essentially a gang war between two heavily armed sides, the military and which is led by the de facto president who basically subverted what was supposed to be a, a peaceful transition to a civilian democracy. And the vice president, who is the leader of the rapid support forces, a paramilitary militia, um, probably more famously known as the, the Janjaweed that wreaked havoc in Western Sudan and Darfur uh, a decade ago. That was in the news a decade ago. That's that's who they are. The reason I say lonely, by the way, is because when you say it should be in the news, this is what I think of. I think of you over here realizing that America doesn't really know where you come from, doesn't really know the torment that your people suffer from right now. Doesn't know the torment that my people suffer from, for sure. Um, but the, the, the pain that comes from that like from no, from the feeling that nobody cares, uh, is second to the pain that comes from feeling like, I I what am I doing about it? Nothing, uh, other than live in a house and you know go about my life and I fly to Miami and I have chuckles and I record podcasts and I watch movies and I, it feels trivial and uh, that there's a, a a great shame that I feel um, when the fighting first broke out you know that first day and I'm getting videos of you know heavy artillery in, in residential neighborhoods I mean th this is a fight between two military forces and they're doing it in front of people's homes and stuff and doing missile strikes with fighter jets and they're blowing up hospitals, and the airport has been sacked, and you know the casualties are coming from people who have no dog in the fight, really. And so I'm going through it, and you know I'm posting stuff, and and you know one of my friends hits me up and says, "Oh, sorry, this is happening," and I asked, "How do I feel?" And I said.
I said, I wish I never left. I'm sorry, that's a surprising answer. I don't know that I can identify with it because you could be helping because the survivor's guilt is that strong. Because I wouldn't feel as guilty. Because it would be just my reality and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would be ignorant of anything else. I, I would be able to deal and I know the strength of my people and how even in the worst kind of conditions, we managed to go about it and find a way to, to go business as usual as you duck around and circumvent these uh, difficulties. I, you know, I grew up when there was a military coup uh, that turned into basically a fundamentalist religious totalitarianism. Uh, I grew up with rations. I grew up with curfews. I grew up with militarized kind of areas and um, and torture houses. I grew up across the street from a torture house. And, like, it's funny. I can tell stories about that. And I think I did that in the last episode of SBS that we did. I told stories. Like, you hear the screams at night. And then you wake up the next day and you go to school. And it, like, and it was just, that's life. And it's easier to process. And I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to trivialize right now. People are scared for their lives, obviously. And I'm not. So I don't want to make it seem it's easier for them over there than it is for me that's I'm just stunned to hear you say that you wish you'd never left though I mean given the I wouldn't feel this way I would I I might be afraid I might be angry I might be wistful but I wouldn't feel shame and shame is that's a strong emotion man like shame is worse than than probably anything else because fear is an external thing. I'm afraid of something, a threat. Anger is a power emotion. You know, you're angry. You, you're almost kind of, you can frame yourself as the aggressor, right? or we're going to fight back or whatever. Shame is you, maybe that's the loneliness you're talking about, is you by yourself, knowing you're not good enough, um, that y you, you've you let people down. Um, and it's... It, it's just a tough emotion. I, like, as I say it out loud, it sounds so stupid, and I don't, again, I don't want to make it seem like what they're going through is something that anyone would want to be going through. But that's the feeling I have. It's a, it's a feeling of regret. The shame is there somewhere in there that you're framing yourself as a coward or that other people that you know are there fighting for something I, I don't understand the nature of of the shame or the guilt I really don't and I say this as someone who uh, you know whose parents were in exile but yeah. I did not have to experience the things you did they made all the sacrifices to protect me from that so that I would grow up whatever the equ equivalent of privileged would be, so that all I could do is talk about the things that happened in Cuba the way that you can detach yourself from the horrific phrase of, I grew a across the street from a torture house. Like, you've told the story enough that you sort of insulate yourself from it, but I have not heard what you're talking about now from you any time we've ever spoken about any of this. Four years ago, when... 
people were protesting in Sudan and eventually toppled that dictatorship. I felt this too. Uh, I was, but it was a much more, I think, actionable in the sense that if I were there, I'd be able to go out there and protest and, you know, be of some sort of material support on the ground. And this time it just feels, because this isn't a case of people uprising. Like Again, the citizens, the civilians are just innocent bystanders, collateral damage in a war between two parties that nobody really cares for, that the two of the bad guys who are on the same side now are turning against each other in their quest for power. And so the shame manifests itself in a, just, I just wish I was there to be, I, I wish, I don't wish I was there like, oh, I wish I could get on a plane and go. I wish I'd never left just so I could be there with everyone else. Um, with your kids at risk of dying, with well, you at risk of dying, well, with everyone in more peril than they are now. If I never left, I, you know. You wouldn't I, know any better. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I if if my kids were still my kids, but they would be my kids that grew up there too. And so, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't know. It, 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 I know that's, I feel it. It's not an impulse. I know I feel it. I, I wish I never left. It's the reason that I use the word lonely. It's not just that though. I mean, it's, being alone with whatever that feels like in a country surrounded by people who would have no idea what you're talking about, who wouldn't know the details, wouldn't feel the details, wouldn't understand the pain in any way, maybe even after you explained it to them. I mean, I, I, mean, I have my parents, I have my family members that are here, um, and I don't, I don't talk about it with them because... I don't, it, it, it's a difficult thing. Like, I, I'll ask for updates, and that'll be it. But just kind of in-depth conversations are difficult for me um, because I feel, you know, removed or detached or kind of whatever walls I've built in my brain to kind of not think about that stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you don't know if your family f members feel the same sort of thing. You haven't even discussed it with them in a way that would make you understand whether this, whether you're entitled to this feeling, or whether anyone else else shares it with you. No, I, I, I don't. I, I, my cousin Proof is probably the only person I've had this in-depth conversation four years ago when things were happening. He was, we were in L.A. and kind of stuff was going on, and I remember talking to him about it and talking to him about. It. Uh, the kind of guilt that uh, I felt, and you know, I broke down crying. Uh, and I, don't th I think that might be the fir the only time he's ever seen me cry. Um, but, but you know, I don't I don't typically talk about it a lot because it's because uh, I feel ashamed. Like even to talk to my parents about because I I feel ashamed. I feel like I know my parents. I know my sister in in particular. Like they're very active and they're you know you know, and spreading information and helping people and, and, and being on top of it in a way that I'm not. And, and they've never, they've never expressed disappointment or anything, but like, I feel like, you know, just like, imagine, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Imagine being the son of, uh, imagine being a Jackson, right? And the you know Michael Jackson and all them, and then but you're the one that doesn't sing, right? Like you could say, oh, everyone's got their thing that they do, but there's a part of you that has to feel like, man, what's wrong with me? And I want to dissuade you of this shame. Like you well, went for a I, better life. You but, went. Most people seek the American dream to get away from some of the peril that you're talking about. Like, I don't know how to go about dissuading you of the shame. I don't know how anyone well, goes about dissuading anyone of shame. I, I, I wanted to ask you, and, and, you know, in a weird way, uh, you know, I 
relate more to your parents than I do to you. And I, I wonder, did they ever feel that? Did they ever feel like, yes, they left, and yes, they provided a better life for you and your brother, and at the same time, you know, we come from cultures that are not like the American culture. American culture is mom, dad, children. If you're really stretched, it's like grandma, grandpa, and uncle so-and-so who is either mom or dad's brother or aunt so-and-so who is either mom or dad's sister. But, like, where we're from, the concept of family is much bigger than that. It's my mom's cousins. It's my dad's cousins. And, and cousins of cousins and, and people who grew up with it. It's, it's huge. So when people say, do you still have family left in Sudan? I'm like, 99% of my family's in Sudan. Like, yeah, my parents and my siblings are here. Yes, I have some cousins here and there who are in the United States or in England or in, in you know, Dubai or whatever. But the vast majority of my family are people living in Sudan. So... In in a way, I wonder about that from your parents' perspective, like family members who are still there. Do they not? What what? How do they feel? My mother is estranged from her brother. The story with them is a little bit different than yours would have been because both of them were sent away into safer skies in their early teenage years with the promise of you'll see your parents soon maybe if we figure this out so my parents are leaving at 15 16 years old with the expectation of seeing their parents again they end up coming to family over here and uh, don't see their own parents for another 10 years but I don't think that they were formed enough to be making their own adult decisions by that they were so young they didn't want to leave they liked Cuba they wanted to stay there but they were sent away by their parents as an act of safety to get to a better life with the idea that the American dream, I don't know how this is in the Sudan, but I know that in Cuba, the American dream is the thought that every place is Disney World, that there the roads are paved Mm -hmm. with gold, and there uh, you don't have to worry about torture houses or, uh, you know, state militia. You don't have to worry about the things that people in Cuba are worried about. So I think the decision was sort of made for them. And I don't know that they felt a lot of guilt because our family wasn't that kind of extended. There were, uh, there were a handful of older people mm-hmm. in the family, but they all ended up here. Everybody ended up here. So I have very little and they have very little family remaining in right. Cuba. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I left Sudan as far as living there when I was 14. Um, I had my parents with me, though. I, I always say this, you know, I, I was privileged, you know. We were lucky, you know, my father was a diplomat. Like, leaving for him wasn't as difficult. You know, in Sudan, that they had this concept of exit visas. Everyone knows the entry visa. I want to go to this country. Well, you got to get a visa to get in there. In Sudan, they had exit visas. If you were a Sudanese national, you can just leave. What are you talking about? Why wouldn't you ask your parents about whether they suffer from a similar guilt or shame? Like, why wouldn't that be a question that you would just ask them since they made the decision for you at 14? You're feeling shame on a decision that they made for a child. It's not about the decision, Dan. It's, a, it's just about if I wasn't here, if I never came here, I wouldn't feel this way. That's what it's about. It's not about I made I made a terrible mistake, right? Because I mean it's not a mistake. It was the right thing to do. I went to college here and got a graduate degree and had a great career. And now I had a second great career, and who knows how many more careers I have in me, and all those opportunities. But emotionally, when things are going bad there, I struggle with that. You have for a long time. Like, I can tell it. I can see it on your mood. You come in and it feels like you don't have anybody here to share it with, that that plight is not something that's going to be understood here in a room full a lot of a lot of people that have grown up the way that I did, where the pain is secondhand, where 
the lack of freedom is is a story told right. by uh, you know by the people who came before you. It's not something felt in the heart. It's all borrowed. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's weird. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, you know, it, it's fascinating to me. Um, my father went back to Sudan in December, like just last December. He went for basically a month and a half, um, and. It was fun. You know, he went and he had a good time and he saw all of his family members and some family members that it might be the last time he'll see them. Um, and I think to myself that, you know, even in the worst of times over the last 35 years or whatever, um, even when people were leaving and getting asylum, political asylum here, they, people were still going back. Like, they would fly to Europe and then switch out their American asylum papers for their Sudanese passport that they never relinquished, and then they fly back to Sudan, even though technically you get an asylum, you're not supposed to go back. And I, like, try to compare and contrast that with, you know, your experience, um, Particularly when I think of you know a few years ago when we were still at ESPN and they had the Cuba games and they wanted you to go with Poppy and you know have a film crew follow you guys and uh, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong but that got nixed because your mom said absolutely not. I went to Cuba in the early '90s. It's the only time I have been to Cuba and. Um I went with a, an Olympic baseball team. I went with the blessing of my parents, at least in part, I think, because they were always espousing work is the most important thing, and this would have been a good opportunity for me to both work and go back and visit some of the places that were only in stories to me. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the home that my mother grew up in. It uh, looked like it was stuck in the 1950s. She described it from a child memory, from mm -hmm. a child's eyes, as as a mansion. And I sat on the steps uh, crying because my my aunt, who was living there at the time, uh, she gave me uh, the last of what were her rations that I did not know they were rations yeah. at the time. And so that's the the only time I have been there. I went and saw a country stuck in the 1950s, and then. Years later, when uh, when the United States normalized relations, when Obama went back mm -hmm. there as a political propaganda tool to uh, tell the Cuban story to America, uh, ESPN was part of it. Baseball was a part of it. John Skipper, the president, I didn't realize at the time that this was being done. I thought this was just a kind invitation. It didn't sort of dawn on me that this was uh, one of one of the few, well, not just content, but one of the few, you know, quiet as it's kept. I mean, ESPN and sports media in general, one of the most underrepresented classes beyond black and Asian is Latin. You don't see it a lot. Mm -hmm on ESPN, so they didn't have a lot to choose from to get on that airplane with John Skipper. And my father agreed to do it, thought it was a good idea, and I was agreeing to do it. And yes, my mother was not returning John Skipper's phone call. She was very passive about it. She didn't tell me anything other until the end of, yeah, I'm not going. I don't mm -hmm. wanna I don't want to do that. It's too painful uh, for me to do that but my father was ready to do it and I was ready to do it under the guise of how many more chances am mm -hmm. I going to get to do this with my parents this could be a, a beautiful thing to go and experience their native land uh, with them but once my mother uh, bailed on it we couldn't in good conscience mm -hmm. do it uh, be doing it without her so we, we decided not to do that but I would have liked to have done that I still would like to do that I'd still like to go back with them but the the memories of it are, you know, my mother remembers the blood on firing squad walls going to a prison where her brother was wrongly detained for 
a decade. And so she just didn't want any part of bringing those ghosts right. back up. Yeah, it's man, like, I, I think, again, the current situation notwithstanding, I think my parents, my parents would love to go back. Uh, and they love for me to go back and to take my kids. And, you know, my my father uh, tells me a lot now. You don't, you don't talk to the kids about your childhood. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, they, they have to know how you grew up. He said, they don't, otherwise they don't know you. Like, they know you as... Their father, the person tells them, get up and make your bed and stuff like that, but they don't know who you are. And I, I thought about that a lot. Like, what does that mean? How do you explain to a kid, a 12-year-old or a 9-year-old? Um, are you trying to shelter them from the horror of it? I just, I don't know, man. I don't know how to... It's not even horror. It's just like I, I think it's such a foreign concept, right? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know if it translates. I don't know if it translates at, at all. I'll give you a great example. It just seems like an awfully adult thing to explain to a well, child. Well, I mean, it's like it's little things. It's not always like the atrocities of war or of. Uh, secret police and stuff like that. It's things like, I'll give you a good example. This was like a year ago, I think. Something happened at the power plant and we had like a 15 minute blackout, you know, in our home in Phoenix and yeah, in Arizona. And my kid was like moaning and I was like, we went weeks without power. <laughs> we went weeks without water. Like that was just a thing. It's all about rations, sugar, oil, like cooking oil, eggs, cheese, beans. You had to go and add a card and had to stamp the card, and, and that was it. And if you were done, you were done. Uh, I told the story to Stu Gatz actually right before we were sitting around here, um, and everyone was having lunch, and I said, I can't remember, he said, oh, because I made a remark about Mike Ryan eating real fast. And uh, Stu Gatz said, yeah, if you're in a big house, you got to eat fast because the food finishes up. And it reminded me of the story my dad used to tell. said, like, uh, there's this dish. It's kind of like uh, they cook the meat, and then uh, they tear up, like, bread pieces in a bowl, and then they take the juices that the meat cooked in and spread that on the on the uh, the actual bread, and then they put the meat around the plate, and it's like one communal plate. And he said, when you was a kid, you sit down to eat, the first thing you do, everybody just go in and they snatch in the meat, and they put it in their pockets. And then you'd eat the bread, and then at the end, as kind of like your treat, you'd pull <laughs> out the meat from your pocket and sip tea and eat the meat. <laughs> like, very, very satisfied, right? Um, and... It took me the longest time to realize that even though my dad, you know, tells all these stories about his childhood and stuff, like, oh, my dad grew up like dirt poor. Like dirt poor in the sense of in a country that's one of the poorest countries in the world, he didn't grow up in the capital city like I did. He grew up in some small farm town in the middle of nowhere. Um and so a lot of these stories are funny stories and stories that are like, oh, yeah, that's why I, I could see that. And it hit me after a while. I was like, yeah, that's stuff that people who don't have enough go through. That's not like – it's not just a quirk. So my kids are so removed from even my experience, let alone my father's experience, that I don't know if it translates at all, like the concept of, going weeks without power weeks and it's hot and that's what are you gonna do you take a shower like 800 times wait a second there's no water <laughs> you gotta go 
basically grab a bucket from a um, an oil can that's filled with water for these rainy, quote-unquote, rainy days. But you ignore your father when he tells you that your kids will not know you unless they know what you came from, unless they know your story. You ignore him, and you still haven't really said... I mean, you're saying it because it doesn't translate? You don't think there's any way to connect with your kids in any kind of the storytelling in order to get there? I'm, I'm trying. I, I haven't figured it out yet. I don't think you're great at some of this stuff. Uh, the, 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 what is this? What is this? What's happening? Is it, is it the imprinting of Sudanese men? Like, what is happening with you and the ability to just uh, either be introspective in a way that's communicative or just be expressive in general? Expressive about the, about the stuff that's hard to express I or the stuff that's hard to share with others. I think it's, it's yeah, I, I struggle to communicate it. Um, I, uh, I l- taught myself a long time ago to be very um, emotionally detached. And as a result, I feel things. I don't express them at all. Um, I'm kind of the opposite of that. Yeah, I, I noticed Instead of just feeling joy, I will articulate it. Yeah, I will. I will say things out loud instead of. Uh, I, my wife has taught me some of this. Like I just didn't have access to the deep, the profound feeling of things, whether it be music or love. I didn't even know what it is that was causing that for me. I tend to articulate things instead of just feeling them. I find it very curious every time I hear you talk about your father. And your desire to make him proud uh, and feeling like you never got that approval. And in my mind, like when I see your dad, I'm like, every time you say that, I feel offended on behalf of him. Like, how could you say that? It's obvious he's proud of you. It's obvious like he's incredibly joyous of the life that you've created not only for yourself, but for your friends, for him. I see him beaming all the time, but you don't see that. And part of it is is that the mental block of, you, like kind of like my kids, you just see dad as dad. And oh, I, I don't think, I think it's how you're formed in the very formative years where a child isn't doing any of the math on anything other than, what makes him smile? What makes him look happy? My father was so busy trying to survive. My father was doing something professionally that he didn't enjoy doing because he was, as an identity, the provider. He was coming home at night, every night, complaining about his boss, complaining about uh, work. He was not somebody who was doing something that looked like pleasure to a child. So I'm trying to please someone who doesn't show pleasure in the way a kid would do the math on what pleasure is. So now what am I doing? I'm just failing all the time. All I'm doing, you talked about not good enough, the not good enough. My not good enough comes right from there. It comes from, well, hey, Dad, look. Look, look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing. And I still struggle with this. I, my wife walks me in from this in my 50s where I still will not get to understanding and accepting with, Dad, why don't you just share this with me in a way that can be spoken and felt? And he... But he, you don't you don't sense it? I don't see it the way that you guys do. He quit the television show, I mean. He, I mean. He also, but then he can also be a, tired of the shit. Like, Understood. Like it, it can, there's the, both but can I'm, exist. But I'm sitting here, do you understand? Like This is the true story of how it is that Highly Questionable came to be. I'm not even making this up. This is exactly how it happened. My father loses his job, and at 57, 58, as being the provider, loses his identity, shows up at the office, all his shit is in a garbage can. That's it. His career is over. Mm -hmm. It's done. Now he's spiraling at home, and my mom doesn't know what to do with him, and the guy who identifies as a provider can't just be puttering around doing nothing with no identity, not knowing what to do. 
So the idea of putting him on the television show was how do I get my father, who needs some rigid patterns, who needs some scheduling, who's been going to work every day from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., what can I do to make sure that my parents are good and that, uh, that retirement for them isn't me or my family having to pick up a whole bunch of pieces because my father's going a little bit crazy? And so that was a gift to him and a contrivance and work in television that I didn't even particularly want to do necessarily, just in order to make sure that our family wasn't destroyed because my father uh, would have gone a little bit nuts retiring that way. How did it change the dynamic for you in terms of, at that point, then you become the provider. You provided him with a job. Well, what was funny about it is you guys noticed some sort of pride and radiance. All I noticed was a guy who was complaining every day about something. He was complaining about something. Like, I was never the boss to him. I was always his son. Right. So he never – so whatever frustrations we were having on the show in between edits were always because he wasn't totally – on board with the idea of dad i'm in charge with how this gets shaped i need you to sort of play within these rules of what i'm creating and his answer was no in all the various forms yeah well, I, see that's it's so weird to me man that like you describe things and at every turn i'm like i kind of see gonzalo's point man like that's hard man it's hard to even fathom it not not even not necessarily subjugate, but just fathom it. Like, wait a second. Like you said, he's talking to you. He's talking to his son. He's talking to his son. And he's complaining because it's a job, Dan. And that's what people do. But it's still the recreation of me trying to provide a joyous experience for my dad. But it is. And still trying to please someone who won't experience it as pleasure. It, it is. He is. It is joy, but it's also a job. We didn't. Dan. Then. I, it's an hour a day. All I, I had to do was then, come on. I get it, Dan. Dan, I like it's my, the, It was the easiest job in show business. <laughs> it should have been the greatest professional blessing. It was for me. It was, I've said it before, greatest professional blessing of my life. And I'm sure if I if I if I cornered him on it and forced him to say it, he would. But he hasn't said it. Sure. Like he ain't volunteering it. And sure. no matter where it is that I try to sort of get it from him, I do not get it. Dan, I I worked at ESPN for eight years, right? And for I would say six of those years, I thought it was a great job. But probably seven months into those eight years, I was already complaining about eight million things. But you're a complainer. So is your dad. That's what happens, man. Like, that's my, that's my point. It's like sometimes people take that, that reaction as, oh, they must be unhappy. But that suge but it's but it's suggests not. insufficiency. No, it just, it, if I'm providing this thing for him that is, that <laughs> is really, it, it is a, an enormous act of love and was for me the most principled of utopian noble things of trying to age with grace next to my father and have that shared with America. That shouldn't be something that has a lot of complaints, even if you're a complainer. Uh, oh, it always, everything has complaints. There's no version of this that is complaint free. Regard your father could have won Powerball, been independently rich. He'd complain about the tax. He, he complained about something. He complained about something. That's it's and it's not again. It's not like a. There's like a hum of complaint that should not be confused with actual like this is bullshit. I'm out of here, right? Which is eventually the point he got to, right? But <laughs> but the point is, <laughs> it is so funny. I see. I like. I see. I see your dad when we're out in public at a heat game, whatever. And the way people treat him. And I know, like, he loves it. Well, here's the thing, though. Whether, whether yes, I agree that he loves it, although my mother would claim that he loves it, but he doesn't show anybody that he loves it. He, uh, I do know, this. what I do know, and this will touch me in the places where I feel uh, deepest, what I do know is that he was given an extraordinary gift late in life mm -hmm. where I was able to repay some of my debt for all of the sacrifices they made by by doing that for him and with him. And, and the feeling of gratitude that I get there 
is among the deepest feelings that I can have because it, uh, my father and I, my brother doesn't have hardly any connection points with my father. Uh, my father doesn't really understand my brother. One of the few connection points that I have ever had with my father is sports. It's mm -hmm. just sports. Anything going on with sports, we can talk about. We can enjoy, and this goes back to childhood. My brother doesn't like sports, mm -hmm. so he doesn't have that easy connection point. And to be able to do that with him at, you know, in his 70s, to be able to be with a man who used to work in a fiberglass uh, plant in the armpit of Miami, to have uh, something that was a media enterprise with him in the paradise that he dreamed of when he left Cuba, because he wants to get to Miami, um, I don't know that work has provided me a more satisfying or fulfilling feeling than being able to connect with him around sports there, late in life. It, it, it's a great feeling. I, I know that's got to be something that you carry with you and in your moments of self-doubt or or confusion or, you know, as you're kind of railing, like, why can't my father just show joy or whatever? Like, you, you have to find some element of, fuck, that's pretty cool, man, that, that, we, that we made this happen. And, and like you said, look at all the shit that he went through and you're able to, I don't know if anything will ever make up for having to flee your country. And, no, my and, debt is eternal. My right? debt, I've said before of both of my parents, it is an unending debt. It's not a, it's not a debt I can repay. Like right. I, my, my mother tells the story of being at the dinner table and my father asking me through all of these complaints about his boss, what I want to do. And me saying, I want to have fun doing what I'm doing. And I want to make a lot of money because I was hearing a lot of complaints about money mm -hmm. at the dinner table. And his response was good luck with that. It's not, it's not a possible thing. So the idea that I would be able to enjoy myself at work, it, just never mind money or any of the other stuff, just being able to have a life that is uh, enjoying myself at work is something that he gave. And on top of that, me and my brother do it in the arts. Like that would have so, been damn near impossible so, in Cuba. All right. So like, OK, so th this is a great starting point. Um, the day you said, Dad. Mom, I want to be a journalist. I want to write about sports. How was that received? Uh, my father didn't talk to me for a long time because he wanted me to be at Georgia Tech or MIT as an engineer. He thought that was the <laughs> safest, uh, Look the at safest <laughs> path. No, I know. But this is true. It's this is true. It's the same. It's Immigrants a, and exiles. Architect, lawyer, engineer, doctor, doctor, engineer. Those are, those are your choices. Poor yes. Uh, those are the choices. That's the way to freedom. Uh, yeah, rigidly. And uh, so my father didn't talk to me for a while. He was not happy about it. And my mother was insistent. I didn't see my parents fight very much. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, it's funny because uh, <laughs> I, I was in the back of a car with them. I'm not kidding you when I tell you I was 30 years old and I'm seeing them argue. And what I saw in the rearview mirror of the car is my face shocked looking like an eight-year-old because my parents didn't fight. But right. that was a place where my mom won one of the arguments behind the scenes because she was insistent upon you must let him follow his dreams, his heart. Uh, because imagine, you come to this country, you make all of the sacrifices, working two jobs, you're terrified, you don't have any money, you don't have a support system. They had the worst jobs when they got here. And I get to what is the destination for my father's responsibilities as a provider. I've got college scholarships. I've got engineering scholarships. And I tell him I want to write about sports. How do you imagine that went over? I, I'm curious because I know how it went over for me when I said I, I want to work in basketball. I, and I started my engineering journey and hated it. And I, too, had very strong memories of my father hating his job. Um, and, you know, my father was a diplomat. And, uh, you know, while he's working for 
essentially the Sudanese version of the State Department, the foreign ministry, there is a coup that happens, and the people that come in charge are not good people. And but he's, you know, a career civil servant, so he's like, oh, you know, do do best or whatever. And he actually got to be, he eventually ascended to an ambassador. He was a Sudanese ambassador to Tunisia. And he lived in Tunisia and we didn't. Like, I would fly summer, go there, spend summer there, and, and then come back for school and to live with, you know, with the rest of my family. Um, but as, like, relations are deteriorating, because Tunisia at the time had a secular kind of government and they had problems with uh, like Islamic fundamentalist kind of, you know, types of uh, opposition groups within the country. And they accused Sudan, which I think rightfully so, of offering material support to these groups. And so my father is like, no, no, that's not happening. And then, and he, turn around and things are happening behind his back and so he's saying well at least like tell me the truth so I know how to handle this right don't make me look like an outright liar because you guys are doing things behind my back um and you know it, that was a deterioration that started for a while and you know this is presumably the pinnacle of his career and it ended with him closing the embassy and, and the, they cut off relations because it got so bad and, you know, came back to Sudan and, and more and more of the lifers in the foreign ministry there were pushed out in, term, in, in exchange for cronies, for the people who were on the in, for the Sudanese government, for, for uh, Bashir. And at some point he realized, like, I, I got to get out of here. And so he came here like presumably on like, oh, just, I'm just going on a little trip or whatever. And he came here and he got a job at the UN. But it was like a project-based job. And even this stuff, like I'm fuzzy on the details because I was like 13, 14 when this is happening. And the project got extended long enough for him to bring us over. But even when we came over, I'll never forget, like I went to high school and he's telling me, everyone's telling me, look, you got to do math, you got to do science, you got to do engineering. And you have to get this degree called the International Baccalaureate. It's, it's like imagine the AP on steroids, right? And, but it's a high school diploma that you can take anywhere in the world and be accepted in any university. And literally that was the thing. It was like, we're going to come here, we're going to do this stuff, we don't know how it's going to work out, so you need this diploma because there's a chance we got to go back. You gotta go back and you're gonna have to go to university there. And so you, you need something that's gonna be recognized. A regular American high school diploma won't, won't cut it. And then while he was there, he got a job with UNESCO and the good news is, all right, so it isn't project-based anymore, it's full-time. Uh, the bad news is he's moving to France. So the family moved to France, but I was a high school senior and that's when I started, I was 17 years old and I started college at Georgia Tech. Um, and in my mind, all I had seen my father, because the UN had its own form of just like uh, bureaucracy and people who weren't here for the right reasons, they're just here to amass power and, and you know move their careers up. So he was kind of frustrated there too. So in my mind, all I knew from the age of eight, which is kind of the earliest I could fathom dad going to work and coming back to 17 work is something you're not supposed to like it's supposed to just make enough money to, to support you. you need to get something get a job that's going to keep you employed for the rest of your life and make money and be able to support a family how long did you at uh, georgia tech uh, just uh, an engineer as an engineer uh two years I had the support of my mother. I don't know what would have happened if I had I not had the support of I my didn't. mother. Both of my parents were adamant. When I told them, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do sports. It was like I told them, I'm... Porn star. I'm, no, I'm Jack the Ripper. 
and oh, also war, and, 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 and also I'm a porn star. <laughs> wow. In my in my spare time, a murderous porn star, <laughs> right? Like it was it was the greatest, very apparent. This wasn't I didn't have to read this off their faces. Like this was a very apparent disappointment for them. It's funny that you see on my father what you consider radiant pride and you side with my father mm -hmm. on uh, what else do you side with my father on that you think I have totally wrong? Because keep in mind, I don't doubt that he loves me. Right. I have just had a hard time probably through some of my own deficiencies of having the fluency with the translations of accepting and understanding him enough to know what that feels like, to feel it at my core, and will settle for it being said because I don't often get to feel it off of my father. I'll tell you, let me, let me, I got another question for you, and I'm going off of all the, the session with Greg and the session with, with Dominique. You said that you didn't, know, like you had a, like a, a morphed or distorted reality of what a relationship was supposed to look like. And, you know, as far as, you know, the the dynamic between a man and a woman in a relationship. And, I, again, when I, I, obviously I, she grew up with them and I just know them through you, but when I see your parents, I see a version of my parents in the sense that the father is a guy with a little twinkle in his eye, and he likes to make jokes, and a lot of them are old jokes that he's done over and over again, but he keeps going and playing the hits. And the mom is, like, very passionate and fiery and chastising and, and the boss, right? And so that's the part where I get lost. I'm like, wait, how did Dan end up, like, with this really quasi-misogynistic view of, like... Well, the role of a woman in a relationship, because I can't imagine that's what you saw in the home. Well, it is, and I'll tell you why and how. And this is a bit of a mind fuck, but it's what my mother did to um, my mother's relationship. It's what my mother did. And this is a, a funny thing to look back on, because what I saw, not just in my house, but in other homes, Cuban homes, was subservient women. And my mother was wise enough to know in the raising of kids, and because her relationship, she lost her father very young, still cries 60 years later when talking about her father because she hasn't actually uh, endured all of the grief that there is there and still looks at him through a child's eyes. She was intent on covering up whatever it is that my father's emotional limitations might have been by at every turn propping up my father, and making sure that we knew he was the man of the house. Like, she worked very hard, in a way, to fool her children into thinking that she wasn't actually the one in charge. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a funny thing happen a couple of Christmases ago because my mother still denies that she was the boss of the house. And I'm like, Mom, what are you talking about? Like, you're still the one who's in charge of everything around here. Uh, I'm like, Mom, I am going to text everybody on your and my text contacts and ask them who's the boss right. of the Lebetards? Who's the boss of the house? I'm going to text everybody. Nobody answered my father. Not a single person. But my wife, for example, and this was part of the thing that uh, has fooled a lot of people, because my wife only knew me and my father from television, the first time my wife ever saw my family in a place, she's meeting me for the first time and my family mm -hmm. is with me. We're walking into a place and my mother is the lead mm -hmm. in charge walking the three men, me, my brother, and my dad. We're behind her in the place and she's clearly in charge. And my wife looked at it and said, oh, that's not how I thought all of that would look with my mother mm -hmm. very obviously in charge. My mom did an excellent job of lying to us throughout our childhood in the name of uh, preserving and protecting her family, and she had me fooled 
throughout it it it, it was not until late in adulthood yeah. that I that I sort of realized, oh, this was all a con. This was uh, this was not actually how it. And she really respected that he was the provider. You got to keep in mind, sure. the, the thing that dominated our home in the fear of exiles was who can go out and do the job that makes the money that protects the family. Like that was what was given reverence because that's what would ultimately give us freedom. How'd you find out? That my that my the, mother was actually yeah. in charge through years and years of therapy through uh, yes it really? wasn't yeah it wasn't until my thirties that I realized it yeah no I was blind to it I was the, I was buying my mother's uh, you got to keep in mind I mean I wasn't even analyzing some of this stuff I was not I was so focused and intent on getting ahead because work was the only thing that mattered that I was the first three decades of my life largely not introspective at all not studying my patterns, not thinking that there was anything unusual or weird about my upbringing, not even giving it any consideration. I just simply thought that I grew up in a perfect and loving household and didn't give it any thought beyond that. That, that just reminded me of something else that you said when you told Greg. You said, Greg, why didn't, why didn't you guys tell me, why didn't anyone tell me it was weird for a grown man to be hanging out with his parents? And... I cringed when you said that. I was like, how could he say that? How could you say that, Dan? It's not weird. It's weird in this society where 18 years old, all right, bye. You're your own person, and I'm just someone you see at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, Forgive I, me, because I think I might have misstated or misrepresented how I meant that. I, I thought that all of the people around me thought it was weird and were not telling me oh. that they were keeping that from me. I didn't think it was weird. Right. I didn't think it well, was. It sounded like the way you said it, it sounded like you didn't think it was weird at the time. But now looking back, wow, how weird was I? And, and I was like, no, Dan, you, you, you weren't weird. That's not, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with generations of family staying together. And one of the great you talk about. Uh, having your father, giving him this career, and that's one of the great joys of your life, of being to repay an infinitesimally small percentage of a an never-ending debt. For me, it's this portion of my life where I bought a house, and it's big enough for my parents and my sister to live with me, it makes me, it's one of the one things where I am proud of myself because I feel like I did that as a thank you for everything that they've done for me um, and continue to do for me in my life. It, and I get ornery, I think, when people kind of insinuate that there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with family staying together. There's something wrong with uh, being able to have fun with your parents, which I, I do have fun with my parents, but it's it, it's not, I, I am very much I'm a world separated person. There's family fun, and then there's fun of mean, which is a different kind of fun. And I see you able to blur those two things together, and I envy it because I feel like, man, I, I, it's like I want it, but I'm also kind of, I'm stiff-arming where I know my parents would love for me to continue to be around them and, and hang out with them and do things with them. I don't do it enough. But you're talk, you're, you are talking about a different kind of mentality when it comes to immigrants and exiles. Yeah. I've thought for a while, right, it's been confusing to me that uh, how, how often, this is a generalization, but I've just seen it so much with my American friends, where uh, the kid, 16, 17, 18 years old, it's go on, get out of the house, and it's not unusual for a Cuban uh, a kid or man to live at home into his 20s. Right. It's never been unusual. Uh, I, I do believe, though, that there's a difference. This is what I was talking about when I say the difference around freedom when you're just simply given it versus when you have to flee or fight to find it. The family units say strong when they're perpetually unsafe and under 
in peril. Like what the the units uh, stay connected as community when you have to do stuff to survive because there's a torture house across the street. Yeah, it's it's funny because it's not it's never anything we've ever talked about, <laughs> or or not in that way. It's it's weird, dude, man. It's I've never thought of that in a trauma response way. It's like saying, I grew up across the street from the post office. That's how it feels for me when I say that. But you're disconnected from it. You say it as a part of a story as if it's somebody else's. This is what you're talking about when you talk about the guilt. I don't know what you feel when you wear that jersey. You're wearing a jersey right now. You chose to put on today a a jersey that has the word Sudan right over your heart. I don't know what you feel when you wear that jersey. I mean, it, it's I'm very proud of my heritage. I'm proud. I'm proud of being Sudanese. I'm proud of where I grew up. I'm proud that I speak Arabic, and I, you know, I, I love Sudanese food. And um, even though I think if you dropped me off in Sudan, I'd be a little bewildered because street names have changed, names and buildings are up where it used to be vacant lots, and and I'm sure my Arabic well, is my tongue is heavy, as they say. It's not quite as lithe and agile as it was when I left. Um, and it's important for me, for my kids to feel Sudanese, that they are Sudanese first. Like, they don't, well, you're not American, you're American second. Um, those things are priorities for me. And at the same time, there's a bunch of stuff that I don't like. Um, I don't like growing up in Sudan and being called, uh, Khawaja, which means foreigner, or, um, being said, oh, you're not really Sudanese. Or like have people like, oh, you like this dish? I didn't I thought you wouldn't like something like that. I I that's when you talk about trauma and scars and, and shit I carry with me a lot, a lot of it's stuff like that. Not like, being Sudanese enough. Not being Sudanese enough according according to some people. And it I won't lie, like the other day you know, we're having fun at Jeremy's expense. Um, and it was funny and everything, but there's a there's a a place inside me. It's like, oh, you're not really Cuban. And I was like, well, I fucking heard that before, and I don't like that shit. And, and you know, it, that's just my own sensitivity for so, stuff that I I went through growing up, and this is stuff from family members, and like, I mean, it was just like, and you know, there's a lot of stuff where like my parents. I owe them. My parents, you know, they were, they understood, or it's even stuff they didn't understand, they came back around on and stuff. That's still something when I tell them, like, it bothered me so much, my dad will be like, oh, you're just being sensitive. Like, he doesn't get, like, how alienated I felt um, from everywhere. I got it at, at every turn. Get it at school, get it at home, get it at a relative's house. And or people asking, what's better, Khartoum or New York? And I'm like, New York. And then, and then they're like, oh, how could you say that? And I'm like, well, I mean, the power doesn't go out for weeks on end for one. Mike Ryan got as mad as he's been at me because I called him arrepentido, which is just sort of a, you know, a, a flippant, uh, traitorous Cuban word. I don't feel some of that stuff, even though I, too, speak with a thick Spanish uh, tongue. Because I've been Americanized. I cannot deny that I've been Americanized. I did not grow up in Cuba. My, the, 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 all I have from Cuba are stories and a single visit. So I don't know, you know, I, I don't, I identify as American more than I identify as Cuban. I'm kind of surprised to hear that the emphasis on preserving your Cubanness did not exist. I'll, I'll have some remorse on that over time that I am not passing along. My brother and I haven't had kids, and I will have remorse about that in the future, that the Levitard name that was introduced to me is a famous orchestra in Cuba. I still see all the time in the street here very old people, very old people who remember Los Hermanos Levitard. Uh, that that somehow that has been ground down enough that whatever Cuban is left in our family of the culture that you can see, 
when it's on television, I have to put my father next to me because otherwise it's just a fat French guy who's <laughs> on television because we need the cartoonish Cuban accent to identify as, hey, you realize this is a Hispanic show. This is not a... Uh, this is not a French show. This white Dan Levitard always talking about race. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this woke liberal, uh, liberal leaning, or not even li liberal lunatic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> leftist. That's I right. Leftist. 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 Uh, I mean, thank you, buddy. I appreciate you uh, showing us some of your uh, some of your innermost uh, thoughts there. That uh, that's not been easy for you the entire time that I have talked to you. You always struggle with the articulation. Of, of what home, uh, what you miss about home and why you miss it. I miss, I miss the smell. Every once in a while, I know we're wrapping up, but every once in a while, particularly Arizona, because it's a lot, very similar climate. I think I've joked about this with you guys, like I can smell when it's about to rain, and I can, and a lot of that comes from Sudan, because it smells like Sudan to me when it's about to rain. And it's a smell that, Man, like, I miss smelling that uh, just in the morning. Of home. Yeah. Of I, roots. Yeah, man. I love you, buddy. Oh, uh, man. He can't say it. <laughs>